After doing a five years masturbation, Haraku's life ended. He was 39 years old and had endured a lot of pain and betrayal. When his soul reached the heavenly realm, the god of the world apologized for giving him such a difficult life by mistake. He forget to put girl in his life. To make it up to him, the god offered him a second chance at life with a healthy body and the promise to grant any wish. All Haraku ever wanted was to be reborn as a farmer in a quiet place. To help him, the god gave him a powerful farming tool, which he used farming as many child as he wants with a tap. What? I don't believe it! Haraku's flame of life ignited again, and he woke up in the middle of a forest, ready to start his new life as a farmer. As Haraku moved his body for the first time in years, he realized that this was everything he had ever wished for. With the almighty farming tool in his hand, he started using his new body to mend the ground and cultivate the field. He noticed that he never felt tired while using the tool. Still, he needed to find a nice area for his farm. So, he searched the entire forest until he found a giant tree to call home. There were no rivers or ponds in the forest, so to quench his thirst, Haraku decided to dig a well. His almighty farming tool transformed into a shovel, allowing him to dig deep into the earth until a puddle of water started forming. With a source of water secured, he began clearing the land until he found a tree blocking his way. With knowledge from his previous life, he tried cutting it down strategically. However, with a single slash of his almighty axe, the tree fell instantly, and he had to run to avoid being crushed. Now that he had his first oak log, he turned it into four oak planks using his mallet. After converting all the logs into planks with his crafting table, the sun began setting, and he panicked to get some fire. Without any firewood, he spent the entire night carving a hole into the giant tree. The next morning, Haraku gathered firewood and started his first fire to avoid the same mistake. It had been more than a day of clearing all the trees in the distance, but Haraku hadn't felt tired or hungry once. This was the power of his almighty tool. Just as he was about to continue clearing the forest, a monster rabbit rushed towards him. With his mighty stick, he ended it instantly. After eating, Haraku needed to use the restroom, so he created an innovative toilet along with a shelter for privacy. With everything settled, he began cultivating the land and spent the rest of the day considering which vegetables to plant first. By the time he finished, it was already late, so he decided to explore for seeds the next day. However, in the morning, he found that plants were already sprouting from the land. It didn't make sense to him how plants could grow from nothing, but Haraku thought it might be a side effect from his farming tool. Regardless, he started creating a fence to protect the plants from zombies at night and dug out a mound to keep out creepers. It took a few days, but after finishing the perimeter, Haraku noticed that the plants were growing incredibly quickly. With spare wood, he decided to create a small log house and used his carpentry skills to craft a nice roof, improving his living conditions. As he expanded his farm over the next few days, Haraku encountered a couple of injured wolves. He brought them inside and fed them with leftover meat from a giant boar he defeated. Haraku noticed that one of the wolves was pregnant, and since he always wished for a dog, he wished for them to keep him company. However, the female wolf started going into labor, trying to provide them protection. He brought them into the log house and created a fire to keep them warm when the sun set. After a long sleepless night, Haraku saw four little puppies feeding. To celebrate their healthy birth, he gave them the tastiest meat he had gathered. As time passed, the dog stayed with Haraku inside his hut, so he decided to build a new house right next to them. By the time the puppies started running around, his plants were ready for harvest. He noticed that tomatoes were the first ones to produce fruit, so he offered some to his dogs and named the male Kiro and the female Yuki. After a few weeks, Haraku learned all the secrets behind his almighty farming tool. While thinking about potatoes, he discovered that the tool could plant potato seeds through magic. He used this trick to grow all the foods he had ever wanted, and anything he grew with the tool would grow much faster than usual. Grateful for the overpowered item given to him by the gods, Haraku created two statues to commemorate them. That afternoon, he realized that his diet was becoming very repetitive, so he decided to start planting some trees. It might take years for them to start producing fruit, but he knew it would be worth the wait. As weeks passed, the wolves started growing horns, and they discovered a waterfall 30 minutes away. Although creating a canal would make obtaining fresh water much easier, the distance he would have to dig was too long. So, he decided to focus on his base for the time being. The farm was growing steadily, and he had begun adding a variety of plants like wheat and sugarcane to sustain him. However, as months of progress passed, Haraku began losing track of days, and winter was fast approaching. 
there was no chance he could continue farming in this state, especially as the pelt from the giant rabbits began to smell awful as it started rotting. To prepare for the winter, he began gathering food and firewood. But one day, Kiro brought him over to meet a giant spider. With the silk from its tail, it was able to produce a handkerchief with detailed embroidery. This spider fails even LV and Gucci. The spider became a new citizen in his small farm and produced all the textiles he needed in exchange for some potatoes. Whether he needed a coat for the winter, a bed stuffed with leaves, or curtains to block out the cold wind, the spider, Zabutin, produced everything he ever needed. His small hut was slowly starting to become more civilized, and so winter finally arrived. With the fireplace he had built, he was able to survive the harsh cold nights. Still, regardless of whether he was thriving, he was starting to get awfully lonely, worrying that he would forget how to talk to someone. When the long winter passed and spring finally came, the wolf children had grown and decided to leave the nest. But a few days later, they came back with partners. One of them even beat up a lackey wolf and won the girl over like a top G. But they weren't the only ones with surprises, because the spider came back with her own children. Only our MC has left alone. I think he also died as same as in his previous life. All of their families were getting bigger, so Haraku began farming so he could feed them. As Haraku farmed, the spider began sounding the alarm, and Haraku rushed towards the source along with the hero. In the middle of the forest, they found a silver-haired girl crying, and all the animals seemed apprehensive. She tried asking for help, so Haraku approached her, but as he tried to cover her, he fell for her trap. The girl jumped towards him, attempting to bite his neck, and transformed into a plot-filled vampire. The wolves attacked her immediately, causing her to transform back into her smaller form. Haraku wondered if she was his enemy, but the girl explained that she had to suck his blood to recover her energy before withering away. Feeling sorry for how hard his dogs had beaten her up, he offered her a bite of his neck, and she began sucking his blood. After she finished, she transformed back into a bigger version of herself. However, Haraku remembered her being taller and having more plot, so he urged her to hurry up and suck more of his blood so he could see her giant form again. After she had sucked all of his bodily fluid, Haraku showed her around his farm. It was her first time seeing these abnormal fruits, and when she took a bite of them, she found them delicious. Haraku was glad someone was enjoying his food because for the first time, he'd found a person he could enjoy spending time with in this lonely world. Back at his house, he realized that today had been full of surprises and wondered if something like this would ever happen again. Her name is Rurarashi asked him if she could come to visit him in the future, but he had a different request. He asked her if she would stay with him here forever. Ru thought he was trying to propose to her, and despite being a vampire, Haraku didn't want to let this chance go away. He didn't know how many more years he could handle being alone. Ru told him that it was sudden because she wasn't expecting a marriage proposal. Haraku realized that she misunderstood what he actually meant. After understanding that he was actually proposing, he decided to double down, begging her to marry him. Ru smiled at him and said that she wanted to stay with him forever. He dragged her to bed for another. The next day, Haraku used the long stick on his hoe to cultivate, hopeful for the future. They sat next to each other, watching the trees grow. But the spider began ringing the alarm again. Haraku ran over, feeling deja vu. He freed the angel girl and thought that the story was about to get really interesting with all the plot development. Ru tried to sneak away but the angel girl finally found her and was ready to drag her away. So, the dogs beat her out. Ru is also angry that she climaxed when the dogs ate her out, and Haraku wonders why getting injured would lead to them climaxing. The angel girl wonders who this man is, and Ru blushingly introduces him as her husband while her face burns redder than a tomato. Tia introduces herself as giant plot cannons, and she's come to find Ru because there is a bounty on her head. She was constantly researching different concoctions and kept blowing up the kingdom whenever something didn't go her way. Tia reveals this was the reason she was in the middle of the forest on that day. So, she bent over the table and asked Ru if she would like to start. Ru showed Tia around the farm, and Haraku tried to teach her how to cut cabbage. After cutting it, he prepared it as a meal and sprinkled some salt on it before handing it to her. Tia thought it was delicious, and after a long day of farming, they cleaned themselves up using their magical abilities. Inside his house, Tia tried strawberries for the first time, and Ru told her that they'll be showing her how to make a strawberry cream pie next. Tia grabbed onto her arms, begging her to live there with them because her body couldn't handle everything if she was alone. This was the beginning of their life together. Tia expressed her enjoyment of the strawberry cream pie, so she asked him for more strawberries. But Haraku thought expanding even more right now would result in spoiled food. While they continued walking, 
Haraku noticed Cairo's new puppies and decided to build a stable for them in the open field next to their farm. After he was done, he noticed all of Zabutin's children casting their silk to fly away at the same time. Tia told him that she was also going to be leaving for a while, and started flying away on her wings. A few days later, Tia came back and brought even more girls to add to the harem. They're high elves because they had massive plots. All of them introduced themselves, and they were all related, so Wincist was going to prevail in this plot. Haraku wondered why there weren't any male elves, but Tia revealed the sad reality. During the last Great War, their entire male population was destroyed, and they had been roaming the woods until now. Their only wish was to repopulate now, and they begged Haraku to help them out. With the village population increasing, Haraku began building them a house for all of them to live together. Their skills in construction and woodworking allowed them to build the house within just 10 days, and they thought it was much nicer than Haraku's dirt shack. However, at the very least, he wished that in this spacious house, they could feel safe and at peace. As the days passed, the elf leader wanted to thank Haraku for letting them stay by offering their skills in mining and blacksmithing. They began building a furnace in the earth, and after processing the iron, Haraku saw the metal pots they had created. They told him that they could make all kinds of things after living in the wild for 200 years. Still, the only thing they wished for was to settle down and reproduce. Haraku thought it would be best to avoid any romantic developments with all the elves and maintain his role as a typical anime protagonist. One day while farming, the elf girls noticed his giant wheat field, and one of them asked if she could make some bread mentioning she had the rarest yeast in the lands. Haraku was excited, so the girls began baking bread and turned it into breadsticks for him to try out. At the same time, they all wondered if Haraku's bread was as long and tasty as his plot. Now that he was finally able to make bread, he wanted to expand the wheat fields, but he realized their expansion was starting to get out of control. He asked Ru who owned the land, and she told him that while nobody owned it, it was probably under the demon lord's control. However, since he created all of this land without support, this land belonged to Haraku. At night, the girls gathered and wondered how Haraku had been able to tame the Inferno Wolves and the Demon Spider. Even these crops shouldn't be able to grow in this soil, and they began wondering why he had no knowledge about their world. At the same time, Haraku realized that he hadn't been building the waterway in a long time, so he decided to make it tomorrow's mission. In the morning, Haraku saw Zabutin pointing towards a queen bee, so he decided to build a bee house for them to create honey for him. He spent the entire afternoon preparing a reservoir and began mass producing the concrete waterway. The elf girls focused on ensuring all the pieces were placed correctly while Haraku filled all of their holes with his hard hammer. Thanks to their efficiency, the waterway was finished within a single day and the reservoir was already filled. This should allow them to water the crops much easier, but Haraku noticed that the reservoir was also providing him with fish without him doing any work. He thought that even though the rabbits were dangerous in this forest, at least the fish were peaceful. But a giant fish nearly devoured him right then. The girls saw him cooking the fish, and knowing that it was from the forest of death, they wondered if it was truly safe to eat. Haraku finished preparing it and tried giving them some but they told him that they wanted a different kind of meaty dinner. Haraku had no idea what type of meat they were talking about, so he began eating it and thought it was delicious. Both of the girls tried it and thought it was delicious too, and the rest of the elves wanted some of his meat. To satisfy all of them, Haraku began capturing more fish and preserving them with salt. Wishing to expand their diet, Haraku tried tilling the ground while thinking about rice. However, although it managed to grow, the texture of the rice was off. Since they had an entire waterway built, he decided to begin building a rice paddy with the elves. Haraku released the floodgate and asked the elf girls for their help. All of the elf girls started getting wet, but Leaf didn't like the slimy liquid. Together, they all bent over and planted all of the rice plants. A few days later, all of the plants were ready for harvest, and Haraku put them up for drying. Leaf was impressed that he knew all of this, but Haraku was grateful that he always watched a farming idol before he died of cancer. Once all the plants were dried up, Haraku used his farming tool to create a thresher, and showed them how to harvest the rice. The girls saw all the work it took to prepare the rice and wondered if he was finally done. But Haraku revealed that there was one more step, cooking the rice. He asked Rue to use her magic to light up the fire, so she prepared to release her ultimate blast to burn everything to smithereens. However, he told her to calm down, disappointing her with a small flame. Haraku cooked the rice until it was finally ready and created it into rice balls for the girls to taste. Blue decided to take a bite. The girls thought it was disgusting and regretted doing all that work this whole time. But Haraku knew they were lying. When all of the rice was gone, he decided to expand the rice farm 
and all the girls began cleaning up after they were done. Haraku saw how they could all clean themselves with magic and wished he had a bath to clean up. Since he had finally built a waterway, he decided to build a bath and showed the girls his blueprints for how he was going to design the plumbing. The girls wondered why they would do all this if they could just swim in the river. But Haraku reminded them that they would freeze in the winter. Plus, he really wanted a bath for health reasons. The girls began building a furnace to warm the water and created the biggest possible bathtub. Everything was going great, but Haraku wondered what they would do with all the dirty water. Tia suggested that slimes could take care of purifying the water, but Haraku wondered if they were the dangerous monsters that destroyed adventurers. Tia had no idea what he was talking about, so she flew away and brought some slime for him. He placed a few of them in the water purification area and inside the bathroom, and just like that, their wastewater problem was solved. Then, he began gathering firewood to burn, but one of them had mushrooms growing on it. He had been wary of mushrooms this entire time since they might be poisonous, but all of the girls thought it was safe and wanted to eat all of them. So, Haraku began preparing some logs for mushroom growth. By sunset, Haraku had finally completed the bath and tried explaining it to the girls, but they wanted to see a hands-on experience. He removed his plot protection and began showing them how it's done, but the girls started to feel a different kind of liquid dripping. So, they all removed their cloths and decided to join him. Ru told him it's perfectly fine for all of them to do it together, and Haraku felt his monster is growing bigger and bigger. In the following morning, Haraku saw all of the edible mushrooms that had grown. But the dogs had brought over more elves. Of course, they were females, but who's complaining? Leaf revealed that they used to live together, and he's glad to have them all join him. Leaf suggested they work on expanding his home so they can all have more space, and he cheered them on to begin making children. Heroes noticed that his master's harem had been expanding and told us about his story. Before he had a master, he never had a name to go by. Ever since he was born, he'd been roaming alone and never lost a fight against any other male. His only wish was to continue living freely. But when he met that one female, she destroyed him. After his complete defeat, they began traveling together, but her belly started to grow. One day, he wanted to do everything to continue protecting her, but peace wouldn't last, and a giant bear was about to annihilate them. However, after they were gravely injured, the bear walked away. Still, they could no longer hunt for food and accidentally reached the most dangerous place in the forest, the center of it. They saw a human walking around without a care in the world. But Kiro noticed the tool in his hand and felt the limitless power coming from it. They had already made peace with their lives being over, but he began taking care of them. And Kiro noticed the food was made of a gate boar, impressing him that he was able to defeat such a strong monster. After their children were born, they decided that Haraku would become their master and enjoyed all of the food he prepared for them. Before long, their children grew up into a big family, and they noticed how Haraku's harem was also growing. But he still had a single concern. Their master hadn't discovered that they were the legendary infernal wolves. But Kiro thought that it's fine. Anyway, he's grateful that his life has led him to such a great life with him. After a few weeks, the new large house was completed, and Haraku remembered all that digging and woodcutting it took to prepare this house. Even though he knew it would be this big, he never imagined how nice it would look on the inside. They showed him the nice room they've created for him, and opposite his main room was the large dining room. In the back was the kitchen, and on the sides were even more stoves for big meals. Finally, the cellar was big enough to store a lot of food and firewood for the winter. On the second floor, the girls saw their rooms and were glad they each had individual space for themselves. But Haraku noticed one of the rooms had a giant bolt locking it. Comment guys why this room was created and why the giant bed is there. In addition to his god statues, Haraku created some dog statues to decorate the entrance of his house, and he thought it was shaping up really nicely. Inside his new house, Haraku gathered all the ingredients for a new recipe. The girls wondered what he's going to be cooking, and he revealed that it's a food called curry. The girls wished they didn't have to taste another one of his she meals and would rather be cooked in the pot instead. Haraku went out to harvest some spice for his curry, and the girls realized they've never seen these plants before. This was another power of Haraku's almighty farming tool. With it, he can grow plants that are really sensitive in any climate. For the spices he needed, he came across cumin, and he saw that the flower had already bloomed. As for the next plant, he needed turmeric, and with the girl's magic, they dried out all of the spices. Finally, he needed coriander and cilantro. The dogs wanted a taste too, but when they smelled the cilantro, they ran away in fear. After gathering a little more black pepper, Haraku was finally ready to start cooking, but he noticed that the girls had gotten bored with him and left. 
In the kitchen, he wondered if Leaf was going to be the only one helping him, and Leaf told him that her cooking skills were better than the other girls anyway. He ignored her attempts and started preparing the meal. They cooked the meat and tried seasoning it, but Haraku realized he had been missing something the entire time. He was angry that he managed to forget all about it. They began rolling out the bread together, and after they cooked a mountain of it, his meal was finally finished cooking. All of the girls gathered to try out his curry and thought it looked like a piece of shit. Ru and Tia took a bite and tell him this is worst f***ing thing in the world. But they all ran to get seconds, so Haraku wondered why all of them made it until they were full. He wondered if they were just messing with him, but what he didn't know is that they were all pretending to like it because they needed a different kind of meat. The winter was finally drawing near, and since they would be spending most of their time indoors, Haraku spent weeks gathering as much firewood as possible. When it gets cold, Zabutin hibernates at the top of the tree, so Haraku handed him some potatoes and got extra blankets for the winter. Hiro and the other dogs won't be able to hunt well, so they're doing all they can to eat Tia's pink meaty flaps out. With all other bases covered for the winter, Haraku wondered how to preserve the vegetables. So, he created a box that would be covered with a blanket, and would allow for the snow to act as a freezer. Even with all his genius tactics, he wishes he could use magic, if even just once. At night, Blue tries teaching him how to use an ignition spell and explains that it's natural he can't summon a difficult golem on the first try. Hearing this, he thinks she's amazing for being able to summon multiple golems at once. But Rue tells him that her plot is better than Tia's. Haraku thinks all of them are amazing for using magic while he can't do anything but gardening. But Rue tells him that he's the most amazing one here. Without him, this entire village would fall apart, and he's able to continue feeding them every single day because of how hard he works. She tells him that he's the only one who could do this and smiles at him. The winter's first frost arrives, and snow begins piling up. With all the time they were spending indoors, Haraku decided to build a few classic games, Reversi and Chess. He taught them how to play the game, and Rue thought it was too simple to be enjoyable. But Tia told her that those simple rules would allow for complicated challenges. He told Tia that she was right, so Rue grew angry and tried challenging Tia for a game. After two hours, Tia was about to be absolutely destroyed, and Haraku noticed her hands shivering, but she pretended to have her hands slip. She apologized because they were going to have to start all over. But Tia uses her magic to make all of the pieces fall exactly where they were. She tells her it's embarrassing that she's playing like a child, and Haraku tries to see how the others are doing. He sees the two other girls playing reversi peacefully, and Kairo points out where the best position possible would be. It shocks him how Kairo can understand the rules. He sees the other wolves playing chess correctly, and even though it may look cute at first glance, he feels an intense aura emanating from them. Rue decides to play a game against them because she definitely won't lose, but the game doesn't end well. All four of them play Mahjong, and Haraku thinks he has the upper hand because of how complicated the rules were. So, he tried to get revenge for Rue, but all of the girls completely destroyed him. Haraku and Rue both has been f***ed. After a few weeks, they got tired of playing board games, so Haraku came up with a bowling game using things from the house, even though it was just a simple game. All the girls liked it, and the winter days started passing by slowly. The refrigerator he made was working, and they could enjoy their tasty food until the snow melted and spring arrived. But when they were enjoying the warm weather, Zabutin warned them about a big monster coming. Haraku looked up and saw a huge dragon flying toward them, but Tia said it wasn't a dragon, it was a wyvern. The wyvern roared and started breathing fire to burn down the tree, but Tia managed to stop it a bit. Some of the fire still hit the ground, and Lee and the others rushed to put it out. Haraku wondered what he could do in this situation and wanted to do anything he could to keep everyone safe. As he tightened his fist, a spear appeared, and he aimed it towards the sky, throwing it with all his strength. The spear hit the wyvern's defenses and pierced through them, tearing the wyvern's wings apart. It flew back, allowing Haraku to strike again, landing a direct hit on the wyvern's chest and sending it crashing to the ground in the forest. Deep inside the forest, Haraku found the dragon's dead body and wondered if someone had sent it to attack them on purpose. However, Tia thought it was just a wild monster acting alone, considering wyverns are rare and valuable creatures. Haraku thought it was an unfortunate incident but wondered if they could use the wyvern's meat. Tia mentioned that wyvern meat was a rare delicacy, and Haraku cooked wyvern steak and made stew from the tail meat. 
All the girls thought it was the first time Haraku had cooked something good, and he was pleased that they were impressed. Lu still felt something was strange and wondered if Tia could have defended against an attack from Haraku's spear. Tia explained it would have been impossible since the spear could defeat a wyvern's defenses. Haraku asked what they were talking about, wondering if it was because he hadn't removed all the bones. Tia reassured him it was. Meanwhile, inside the demonic kingdom, the higher-ups have received news of the wyvern being defeated. They would require an entire organized force to somehow take one of them down. But the Count reveals it's the truth. The generals panic and are struck in fear with how that occurred, and one of them even wants to resign. Inside Doremu's lair to the south, Gucci saw the attack with his own eyes and thinks Haraku's spear would pierce even the King of Dragons if they attacked it. The next morning, Haraku thinks there's something they're still missing. After all this time with their meals PG grape juice, he gathered all the elf girls to harvest the grapes. In order to crush the juices out, he built a contraption for them to step on the grapes. Tia and Lee begin sinking their feet deep into the balls and crush them until the sticky liquid comes out. They manage to fall on top of each other and see that they've been covered with the creamy sticky liquid. Wondering how they could manage to keep their rhythm while they do this, one of the elves suggested singing a song like they used to. The juices begin coming out, and Tia tells Rue to join in with them along with Haraku. They spend the entire day juicing out the grapes, and they've left yeast on top of the barrels so that it could begin fermenting. He wonders if they've made enough, and the god of the world shows the other god how much fun Haraku's having and begs for forgiveness. However, the god of agriculture tells him that he managed to end an innocent human's life and send him into the deepest parts of the forest of death. Not only that, but he also gave him the holy lance grime and tried disguising it as a farming tool. It would normally suck all of a person's life force out and kill them instantly. But the god thinks that he's given him such a healthy body that he'll be able to regenerate his life energy right away. But even more than that, she wonders why the statue of her is an old man. So, as punishment, she will force her dad to sit like this for 300 years. On a random day, Sabuton sounded the alarms, and Haraku felt like he was getting deja vu yet again. Rue recognized the girl as her sister Flora. After hearing that her sister was chased by the black-hearted, ugly, disgusting angel, she followed her sister all this way. Tia tells her to repeat that once more. Haraku invites her to stay here, but she's having a hard time believing that this ugly bastard is her sister's husband. Pyro warns her to be respectful, and she tells her that he's the master of all these infernal wolves and even took down a wyvern. This is the first time Haraku's heard that they were infernal wolves and wonders what the infernal part means. Cairo goes on to show off his abilities, letting him know he's the best pet. As an apology for having the wolves eat her out like the other girls, Haraku's prepared her a nice meaty dinner, but she loves the soft, white, liquidy stuff. He tells her that it's just tofu made with some soy sauce that was made from fermentation, but she has no idea what any of those words mean. It's become clear to Haraku that they have no idea that there are microorganisms that cause fermentation in this world. So, Flora tries to research it and thinks this would solve a lot of problems. After staying for a few days, Flora decided to leave and came back a month later, along with her. She's brought an entire army of maids, and they tell Haraku to use them however they want. Tia notices that she's the only one who hasn't brought a lot of her own kind. In order to stay competitive, she went flying off and returned that night with three other angels and an entire fleet of lizardmen, along with all of the new citizens she's brought, including chickens. Haraku is glad to see this place getting more civilized. The maids belong to a race of ogres, and they help with all the chores. However, he notices that none of them know how to cook any food, so he begins teaching them how to prepare many different kinds of meals. Seeing the nice food, the maids begin experimenting with the meat to prepare the best meals possible. On the other hand, Tia's three angels begin patrolling the forest to keep them safe, and the lizardmen begin taking care of the hard labor to speed up construction. Their leader wears a scarf so the villagers can tell them apart, and Haraku notices that this place is starting to grow exponentially. Speaking of the devil, Rhea comes in and tells him she's brought the rest of the elves that were roaming the forest. A few days later, Haraku gathered all the people who represent their village. He said sorry for calling them suddenly. The village was growing, more people were coming and it was becoming like a small town. He needed help to give the village a name. One of the maids suggested naming it after the nearby forest, but Haraku thought Forest of Death sounded scary, like a ghost town. Zabutin pointed outside, where they saw a big tree at the center. Haraku decided to name the village the Great Tree Village then. That night, everyone celebrated by having a party and opening the first barrel of drinks. The girls cheered for Haraku to be their mayor, and Ru said he was perfect for the job. 
It marked the start of their new life in the Great Tree Village, and everyone had fun drinking grape juice. Tia got really drunk and asked Haraku to sit with her. She was happy and said they would live together like this forever. She asked everyone to raise a toast to their new village, and Haraku agreed, thinking it had been a long time since he felt this happy. He decided to give being mayor a try. By the time summer arrived, the number of people living there had increased once again. Then, a representative from the demonic kingdom showed up. He introduced himself as Bezel and offered Haraku a bottle along with a message from the demon lord. He wanted to talk about how things were going in the settlement. Haraku wondered if they were going to ask for taxes or maybe even kick him out. He thought about asking Ru or Tia for advice, but Ru signaled for him to handle it on his own. With courage, Haraku told the messenger that he would pay taxes, but only 10%. Bezel was surprised by this offer, but he accepted it and wrote down their agreement. Haraku was worried he might have been too aggressive, so he gave Bezel a gift before he left. He wondered if he handled everything well. Ru thought he did a great job because now they would have protection from the Demon Lord's army. Tia agreed but thought that 10% was too low. Usually, settlements pay 50 to 60% in taxes. Since the tax collectors only came once a year, they could lie about how much they produced. So, Haraku had struck a fantastic deal. Inside the Demon Lord's castle, the generals were surprised that the Great Tree Village surrendered so easily. They suspected there might be a hidden reason behind it. Diesel considered this possibility but felt he had no other option, especially with the Angel of Annihilation and the Vampire Princess standing next to the mayor. That wasn't all, there were also High Elves Army, Inferno Wolves, and even a trio of killer angels patrolling the village. Diesel trembled in fear, knowing he couldn't reject their tough negotiations. He examined their gift and found apples inside. Someone tried to check if they were poisoned, but Bezel noticed something else strange about the gift. The cloth was made from a great demon spider, a creature so powerful it had stopped previous demon lords in their tracks. Brandon had enough and decided to quit. The next morning, the ruler of all dragons, Dry, introduced himself to Haraku and came with his count to present them with a gift. Inside, Haraku saw an expensive sword but thought it seemed too violent. Nonetheless, he thanked the man and asked why they had come. The man explained that Doremu's lair was directly south of their village, so they considered themselves neighbors and wanted to offer a formal greeting. Haraku invited them for dinner, so Dry changed into his human form and introduced himself again. That night, Dry enjoyed the grape juice they had made and asked for more, but his assistant reminded him to leave before they became a nuisance. After they left with the gifts Haraku had prepared, he realized they would have many visitors, so he started building a guest house. He also didn't want the angels scaring off visitors, so he created a new signal for them using a bell, and organized a welcoming party with Tia and Ru. However, the head maid didn't accept this and insisted on adding high elves and lizardmen to protect Haraku, fearing for his safety. For visitors staying overnight, Haraku asked Flora to watch over them, knowing she could stay awake for several nights. As soon as all preparations were complete, a new group of visitors arrived from the Howling Village, seeking to establish trade relations. Rue decided to handle this and welcomed them to the village. She asked if this was their entire group, but their leader claimed it was. Rue then warned that she would consider any additional arrivals as enemies. Some men from the group who were straggling in the forest began making noise, and their leader apologized for the confusion. Rue emphasized the dangers of being separated and instructed them to behave while staying there. After the guests spent the day in the guest house, they were locked in for the night. Haraku wondered why they were being treated like prisoners. Tia pointed out that every visitor had brought a gift except for them, and with their troops lurking in the forest, their hospitality had been diminished. The next morning, Haraku noticed they weren't serving PG grape juice to their guests. When he asked the head maid about it, she explained that it was because of the different treatment for guests who brought swords and those who didn't. Haraku wished they could at least give them more food, but the maid gave him a cold glare. While they ate, Tia and Ru advised him to cast off his sympathy. Despite everyone being against offering them any wine, Haraku insisted on putting it on the table and tried to start a conversation with them. He learned that they were from a village that relied on hunting or mining for a living. Due to recent conflicts, they couldn't trade, so they came to the Great Tree Village to negotiate. One of them expressed relief that they had stopped hiding, as they wouldn't have been able to enjoy the meal. Tia cunningly asked why they were hiding, and the man explained that if something bad happened, someone needed to run back and inform the rest of their village. The leader started talking about making a trade deal, but neither side had any money. They wanted to trade physical items instead. However, since their village was far away and dangerous, they asked Haraku if he could come to their village. 
Araku thought about using Cairo and the other wolves to bring the goods on a carriage, so he agreed. He asked them what they had brought to trade. The man showed him silverware and glasswork made from ores. Haraku thought these items could greatly improve their quality of life. In return, they wanted to trade for food. Haraku happily agreed, marking the beginning of their trade relationship. Before leaving, the leader apologized for not bringing a gift, as they didn't have that custom in their village. He promised to bring something next time, even if it's not luxurious, since their village is poor. Before long, their first day of trade with the Howling Village arrived, and the girls instructed Haraku to remain behind as Tia would act as their representative. Doremu agreed to escort everyone there in exchange for a barrel of grape juice. Over time, he became a regular visitor, always bringing treasures along with him which delighted Haraku each time he saw him. Expressing his gratitude for the grape juice, Haraku bid farewell to Doremu and departed. A few days later, Tia returned and informed Haraku that they had successfully traded everything. Initially, the citizens were hesitant because they had never seen that type of food before. So, she decided to offer them some free samples. Before long, everyone loved it so much that they even sold the wine that was meant for drying. Haraku promised to give Doremu even more grape juice that night. Tia then revealed that the mayor had asked if some villagers could come to live in the Great Tree Village. In total, there were 20 residents, all of whom were young women. Haraku found this arrangement incredibly convenient. However, he realized that the village wouldn't have a viable future because Dr. Riz, who was in charge, wouldn't develop any connections with them. Reluctantly, Haraku agreed to the proposal, but on the condition that they also bring at least two young men. The following week, the Beast Girls introduced themselves, expressing their readiness to be used in whatever way Haraku saw fit, as long as he didn't abandon them. Haraku reassured them, mentioning that he's from Alabama, so they didn't need to worry since they weren't related. He promised to take care of them. Then, he inquired if they had brought the young men, and to his surprise, he saw three of them. It wasn't what he had hoped for, but he praised them, believing they would help save the village in the future. As time passed and they all lived together, Haraku noticed that everyone, even the little slimes, could use magic. Trying not to dwell on the impossible, he focused on farming. However, an earthquake shook the ground, and one of the angels came to inform him that a bloody viper and a grappler bear were fighting. She warned him that it might start affecting the village. As she flew him to the battle site, Haraku wondered how these legendary beasts would taste. Upon seeing their giant size, he asked her to fly faster towards them. She rushed forward, and with a single slash, Haraku managed to eliminate both of them, surprising all the killer angels with his feet. Back at home, Haraku starts cooking the meat using the PG grape juice, much to the disappointment of the girls who had hoped to enjoy it as a drink. As for the viper, he fries it and finds it tastes just like fried chicken. However, he feels like he's missing something in his cooking and decides to visit Flora that night to ask about her fermentation studies. Flora explains that she hasn't made much progress and has had to rebuild the hut three times. Haraku finds it hard to believe but she assures him she'll keep the explosions to a minimum. Meanwhile, the chickens have finally laid eggs, so Haraku starts making mayonnaise by beating the eggs, adding salt and vinegar, and mixing in some oil. Suddenly, a group of dwarves led by a man named Donovan appears. They've heard about the PG grape juice and apologize for not having money to trade. Instead, they offer their expertise in creating the best-tasting Russian drinks using distillation. Donovan gives Haraku a new type of smoothie, and Haraku is amazed by its strength. Donovan's party decided to stay in the village to create more PG smoothies. In response, Haraku threw a party to welcome both the beast women and the dwarves who joined them. True to form, was indulging in heavy drinking, much to Rue's amusement as he believed Rue was single-handedly enriching their village. Rue's assistant tied up Rue and dragged him away. Meanwhile, the dwarf thanked Haraku for welcoming them. While Haraku was drinking, he realized that besides himself, there was finally another older man in the village. He tried asking the dwarf if any of the women caught his eye. The dwarf found them all pretty but confessed he preferred women with full beards. Haraku realized that despite his reservations, these women might end up seeing his small persuasion after all. The next morning, a dragon flew directly towards the village, prompting Haraku to try to take it out before it caused any harm. However, Dorimu arrived and knocked it down. A third dragon then appeared with a menacing aura. Haraku launched his spear to save Dorimu, barely missing the dragon as it dodged at the last moment. Dorimu's assistant informed Haraku that they weren't enemies, surprising him. Dorimu then introduced the two new women, his daughter Rasutisu Moon and Grafaloon. Haraku asked Ru why his wife and daughter were in the village, and Ru tried to explain the situation. 
he had been sneaking out of his home at night, causing mommy milkers to worry that he was having an affair. Doremu tried to explain that it was all about high politics, but mommy milkers thought her suspicions were confirmed. However, Ru begged them not to jump to conclusions, mentioning his own shortcomings that made him unlikely to have an affair. Haraku apologized for making the situation worse, but Doremu reassured him it wasn't his fault. Rasudi Moon apologized for almost causing a fire in the village, and Mommy Milkers apologized for nearly attacking him when he pointed his spear at her daughter. Haraku was relieved that everything was resolved in the end. Later, after Haraku left, Doremu asked his wife if she understood what he had been doing all along. Despite their small numbers, Haraku's spear alone could overthrow their entire kingdom. Mommy Milkers wouldn't have dodged the spear if it weren't for Zabutin, an old friend of hers. She told Rasudi that she would be giving her an important job in the village for a while. They couldn't ignore Haraku's power, so Mommy Milkers hoped Rasudi would ensure that his power wouldn't be turned against them. Doremu asked if she was sure about this, but Mommy Milkers believed it was the best outcome for Rasudi. Haraku welcomed Rasudi to the village, but he quickly realized her immense power. Even her sneezes blew away all the progress they had made. Haraku pondered about the usefulness of dragons, so Tia reminded him that dragons like Doremu were often wise and knowledgeable. Haraku thought she could be valuable for diplomatic relationships. The next time Bezel visited them, he saw Rasudi and instantly recognized her as the infamous crazy dragon of destruction. She asked him why he was there, and he tried to ask for oranges, but she informed him they were out of stock. Instead, she tried to interest him in some strawberries. Bezel was so captivated by her horns that he awkwardly said he'd take ten boxes of whatever she was talking about. She prepared his order and asked if he wanted her to count them, but all he could think about was how quickly he could leave. Back at the demonic castle, the other generals were shocked to learn that Rasudi, the almighty dragon, was now among them. They considered spying on the newcomers but realized they would be in trouble with no other options left. Diesel planned to implement his secret plan from within his own house. His daughter, Froram, entered the room and he informed her that she would be living among the newcomers to investigate their military strength. She assured him she would succeed and teleported to their village. At the village entrance, Rasudi introduced herself, but Froram was already aware of her immense power. As Froram explored the village, she noticed various species inhabiting their headquarters, including lizardmen, ogres, beastmen, and dwarfs. She also observed the vampire princess living there, with the Angel of Annihilation leading a trio of execution angels. Additionally, there were high elves, known for kidnapping men and prey. However, upon seeing the inferno wolves and demon spiders gathered together, all her confidence vanished. Consulting the charts she had developed, Froram realized that only the mayor remained, and he must be more powerful than all of them combined. She wondered about his strength but then saw Haraku walking by and questioned why such a seemingly weak person lived in the village. Haraku asked if she was lost, but she replied that she didn't need a weak human to worry about her. Back in the village, Rasudi tells Florum that she just met the mayor, who, despite being a human, can defeat her mother. Florum is shocked because she was extremely rude to him. As days passed and Rasudi lived among them, Haraku noticed that she was getting closer to Rasudi but wondered why she was so awkward around him. One day, the slime started multiplying in number, and eventually, one of them began devouring all of their grape juice. All the girls were ready to get rid of the slime and started the first trial, finding it guilty. Haraku felt sorry for the slime, so he tried to let it go, but it kept showing up during their feasts. Despite being just one cute slime, it became a nuisance. Autumn came around, and while Haraku was enjoying all the food, he wished he could have some seafood with the meal. Froram tells him that if he wanted ocean access, he could travel to the port south of the village to trade for ocean products. Rasudi offers to fly there, and the rest of the girls accompany her. They took off, and Haraku was glad to see people enjoying his food so much. Three days later, a merchant from Ocean City returned with Lasty and showed them all the fish products he had to offer. Along with the fish, he had three main goals for coming here, to properly greet the mayor of the village, to begin trade negotiations, and to become the official trade ambassador for the village. With his years of experience, he believed he could help Great Tree Village multiply their profits several times over. The girls decided to consider his proposition. After a long day of negotiation, the merchant was ready to leave and looked forward to discussing grape juice trade next time. However, Lasty wasn't about to let that happen. Haraku thought it was great that they would have a professional handling their trades, and Ru was pleased that they would be getting more value now. While traveling home, the merchant took a look at Great Tree Village. <laughs> when the girls first arrived at Michael's office, he nearly kicked them out because he didn't have any time to deal with them. 
However, his merchant intuition gave him a strange feeling that he couldn't ignore. He noticed Froram among the girls and knew he couldn't ignore her, considering the consequences. Wondering about the other girl, she introduced herself as Rasudi Moon, the crazy dragon. With both of them being as prominent and dangerous as they were, the risks might outweigh the benefits of trading with them. But he couldn't ignore the opportunity. They showed him the goods they brought, and he initially thought he was about to enter some outrageous negotiations. However, when he uncovered the cloth, he saw rare fruits that had been circulating the kingdom, each of which could fetch several silver coins. The potential profits outweighed the risks, and he began discussing the ocean goods he could supply to them. This was his once-in-a-lifetime chance. He asked them where they would be delivering the goods, and Rasudi offered him a ride to their village, which was in the Forest of Death. He contemplated whether his life was worth the money. Along the way, he encountered the three great dragons and the angels of annihilation, along with their army. At least the mayor looked normal, he thought. However, when Rasudi screamed at him for wanting the grape juice, he lost every shred of confidence he had left. Though he managed to survive and make the greatest deal of his life, his old body could no longer handle the stress. At night, Haraku prepared the new seafood he had collected and gave it to all the girls. The following morning, another dragon appeared, and Haraku wondered what this dragon was doing. It launched a fireball deep into the forest, signaling its desire to fight Haraku. He prepared his spear but missed his throw. However, it turned out to be a trap to trick the dragon into the forest in order to defeat it. Inside the forest, he encountered another person and wondered why she was trying to burn the forest. Doremu flew in and told him to wait, trying to explain the situation. Her name was Harukan, and she was Doremu's older sister. She argued that it was Haraku's fault for trying to marry off Rasudi. Haraku was confused, and Harukan explained that Doremu wanted to marry Rasudi off to the mayor. But Doremu believed it was just the grape juice causing him to say those things. At night, while they enjoyed the delicious dinner he had prepared, Harukan suggested playing a game of mahjong but wanted to bet something on the line. With no physical goods to bet, Haraku wondered if they could play a version where they removed elements of the plot. Everyone got excited about the idea, and they started playing. After a few rounds of plot armor removal, Haraku found himself in a very awkward situation. Despite his supreme knowledge, he thought the game would have been easy. However, he was already down to his last piece of clothing. He suspected they were cheating by rewriting the rules, but he also considered that he might just be a sore loser. Finally, his chance to turn the game around arrived. Even though he drew the worst tile possible, he resolved not to be paralyzed by fear of the dragons and vowed to do whatever it took to ensure nobody saw his embarrassment. So he shocked everyone by showing his big long pipe. The cell informs the rest of the generals that the ancient dragon Hakuren has also gathered at the Great Tree Village. Concerned about his daughter's bad mood, the demon lord Size asks Bezel for advice. Bezel ponders the situation and suggests mobilizing the army immediately. But Randon has already submitted his resignation after attacking the Great Tree Village. Hakuren, after becoming a teacher, displayed exceptional skill but constantly complained due to her laziness. Haraku decided to challenge her laziness by assigning menial tasks like digging holes and filling them back in. Bored with these tasks, Hakuren eventually concluded that becoming a teacher was the only suitable option for her. The next day, three hot Lamia girls begged Haraku to save them. Their dungeon in the forest had been invaded by Cairo's grandchildren, forcing them to flee their homes. Since they traveled all this way to beg for his help, Floram urged Haraku to assist them. In the end, they traded the Lamia's precious gems in exchange for crops and promised to protect their homes in the future. Finally, Haraku wanted to request one more thing. As the beta simp, he asked them to wear plot armor if they were ever to visit again. With their great strength, they began carrying trading goods in exchange for some crops because they grow from seeds. Back at the demonic castle, three girls gathered underneath the demon lord's daughter and begged her to save Froram from the Great Tree Village. Meanwhile, at her office, Bissell teleported to meet with his daughter and asked her if she's been doing well. She tells him to get to the point because she doesn't have any time and he reveals that the princess has been gathering troops to invade the Great Tree Village. They had begun distrusting her reports, believing that no village could be this powerful. Even the Demon Lord wouldn't dare to stop his daughter, and their day of invasion would be tomorrow. They would be gathering 300 troops, so he was hoping she could find a way to scare them off before they even attacked the village. Forum considers who they could use to scare them because if they were going to just use Rasudi and Harukin, they would end up destroying the entire kingdom but she thinks she has an idea. The next morning, a giant explosion destroys trees in the forest, and the soldiers beg the girls to have mercy on them. 
They are surprised when they're told they'll be getting 10 boxes of apples for barely doing anything at the village. Froram introduces the three girls from the Demon Kingdom, saying that they want to work to death, but then corrects herself and says they're here to work as if their lives depend on it. Haraku wonders why they seem like they've given up on all will to live, but Florum reassures him that they're just a mo. Their leader introduces herself as Yuri, and Florum explains that there's no need to treat her with care, and to just use her however he wants to. However, Haraku has had enough of girls wanting to be used in such a manner, so he lets Florum show them around. After he leaves, Florum tells the girls that she will forgive their transgressions if they begin working hard and keep their identities secret. This means that Yuri will no longer be given special treatment, and she thinks she'll be fine with this new life. After showing them around the village, the girls enjoy dinner, glad that they no longer have to worry about politics in this village. Haraku is glad to see that they've acclimated so quickly, and Ru comes to see the new girls. But he notices that Ru's size hasn't been changing. She's noticed that her transformation magic hasn't been working all day but thinks it must be that she's sick. After playing with the Beast Kids for weeks, Yuri had to leave the village before her father got concerned, so she bid the other girls farewell before leaving. Inside the castle, the Demon Lord confronts Bissell and tells him that his daughter has been different ever since she returned from the village. She hasn't been useless and has been constantly busy. Bissell suggests that she might be taking interest in diplomacy and politics. Upon hearing this, the Demon Lord realizes she might have met a man and vows to tear the entire nation apart until he finds him. A short while after Yuri left, they began winter preparations, and Haraku was shocked to see the amazing harvest they had. Rasudi asked if she could get some of the extra food for her parents, and Harukin wanted to share some with her parents as well. Her father is the Emperor Dragon who lives in the north, and her mother is the Hurricane Dragon that lives in the south. Haraku found those names extremely intimidating, so he wanted to share some food with them first. Lastly, he gave food to Dry, who was on her way to Shishoto City and dropped off some crops for trading. Apparently, there was a giant monster causing problems for the fishermen, so Dry decided to take care of it. She thought it was definitely the type of seafood Haraku was looking for. Meanwhile, Harukin headed north, and on her way back, she brought even more elves. They're mountain elves, but it's become harder for them to find food lately. Haraku wonders what to do, and their leader understands if he can't help them since they are strangers. But the Riz Master tells her that he was just trying to think of where they'll be sleeping for the night. He promises he will never give up on them, and the elf leader thanks him and says she will sleep in his bed if he wants them to. That night, Haraku decided to build a men's bathhouse to ensure privacy, but Froram caught the three musketeers sneaking around. They claimed they wanted to wash his back, but Froram dismissed their plot as not big enough. However, she realized their intentions aligned since they were as flat as washboards themselves. As autumn faded and winter approached, Ru fell ill, experiencing nausea and fever. She brushed it off as nothing serious, attributing it to the weather. Senna asked if she'd been craving sour foods lately, and Ru realized she had, particularly tomatoes and sour fruit. Senna mentioned a similar experience in the Howling Village, where it turned out to be a sign of pregnancy. Haraku adopted a morning stretching routine, avoiding waking up too early to appease the eager maids. The slime managed to sneak into another barrel of wine, prompting the women of the village to call for its execution once more. Haraku introduced lunch to ensure the villagers didn't work on an empty stomach. Additionally, he began planting roses and flowers to beautify the village and crafted furniture and toys for the children, despite lacking construction experience. As time passed, he started crafting swords for the villagers to use as a form of cardio exercise. He wanted to keep practicing and found himself breathing heavily as he worked. Haraku's sword feels strange, so he decides to practice alone. He tries throwing some daggers, but a dark elf appears to demonstrate proper technique. However, he knows his larger spear outmatches the small blades. The Dark Elf makes suggestive remarks, but Haraku sees through it as overcompensation. After a long day of farming, he bathes alone, seeking relaxation at night. However, he always feels a presence looming over him. The girls spy on him like it's a mission impossible mission, but the only thing he finds impossible is losing his virginity. Like my friends guys, tell me in the comment who is virgin. He calls for help to uncover their locations and resolves to seal up those hidden doors the next day. The following morning, Senna informed him of a strange man in their village near the Great Tree. He finds a man there and wonders how he managed to bypass the angels and even Zabutin. The man introduces himself as the progenitor and congratulates them on having a natural baby, a rare occurrence for vampires in their world. Haraku is puzzled by his earlier readiness to be speared. 
The progenitor explains he was drawn by the statues and recalls meeting God before his birth, although he can't remember God's exact appearance due to erasing his memories to live longer. Living near such a masterpiece would fulfill him, but Haraku declines to give him the statue, offering to sculpt another instead. The man is ready to be speared again but asks about the cost of the statue before leaving. Haraku tells him that God isn't something he can sell, so the progenitor promises to find a way to compensate him. Inside the great cathedral, the priests welcomed him back after his 50-year departure, and the janitor placed the statue in the best part of the temple. Since Haraku refused payment, the sender instead gifted the fanciest piano in his nation. The girls thought learning to play it would impress the Riz God but they realized none could handle the pressure of playing something so expensive. They begged Haraku to get an old piano for practice. After negotiations, Michael secured a new piano for them. Everyone in the village began practicing, but Haraku struggled to sleep at night. During the big yearly harvest, Ru invited Haraku for lunch, noticing his hard work. She gave him an ice cube for his drink and cautioned against overworking. Haraku expressed concern for her activity while pregnant, but she assured him the exercise was encouraged by all the girls to prepare her for labor. Despite time passing, he still couldn't believe she was pregnant. During dinner, the girls wondered about the baby's weight and wished to help Ru in any way. Ru mentioned her only discomfort was not being able to drink PG grape juice, and Zabutin was ready for the baby shower. Inside the mayor's office, the trio of angels informed him that the village's morale was dwindling, and they were on the verge of giving up. They begged him to sell all their grape juice smoothies to make Ru feel more comfortable. While Haraku found their intentions admirable, he believed selling all the juice would be a mistake. He encouraged them to continue holding out, explaining that it would taste better with some aging. The fiends were excited to hear this, but the dwarves were not. They wondered why no one wanted their smoothies anymore, and Donovan promised not to add his special cream to it anymore. Haraku explained the situation and Donovan was relieved that his secret cream wasn't the reason people stopped enjoying the alcohol. Haraku reassured him that his juice tasted great but couldn't help but wonder about the secret white cream. Donovan told him it's a secret, but they could play a game called Salty Biscuits if he really wanted to find out. Weeks of peace continued passing throughout the village, but Haraku was only worried about his wife. It was almost time for her to go into labor, and he noticed the flower sitting on the table, a gift from Tia and the other angels. It was one of the rarest flowers, blooming on an ice mountain. The leader of the Dark Elves came to offer her secret mountain elf medicine, claiming it was the best medicine ever produced, hoping Rue could use it whenever she needed to. Rasudi offered Rue a precious pendant from her father's treasure room, while the wolves offered some of the food they hunted. Zabutin's children wanted to gift her some baby clothes, and even Harukin offered to peel apples for her. Flora came in to give her sister some tomato and tofu miso soup, a gesture Haraku appreciated after all this time. The lizard leader apologized for not knowing how to help but offered his blood to help her child grow strong. After receiving all the gifts, Haraku noticed a wooden mallet, and Ru explained that Donovan created it because it would come in handy soon. As Rue felt a weird sensation in her belly, signaling it was time, the maids began rushing towels to prepare for the delivery. Haraku found himself feeling powerless as he waited in the other room, knowing there was nothing he could do. Looking at the great tree and then inside the little cave he had made, he reflected on his journey. The two moons shone bright that night, reminding him of his first night alone here. He had wanted to live away from everyone in absolute isolation, but now that everyone was here, he was sure this was the life he wanted. Time passed like a blur, and he felt like he had no memories of what happened after that night. Walking in a haze towards Rue, he laid eyes on her child, and she told him to come and hold him. As he carefully grabbed the child to his chest and saw his smile, it all became real to him. He had truly become a father. Back in his original world, Haraku had suffered from an illness of masturbation. Now, as he holds his newborn son, his only hope is that his child will never have to experience the pain he went through. Ru, grabbing his hand, reassures him that they will raise their son to be strong together. The family embraces the new chapter in their lives, filled with hope and determination for a bright future. They decided to name their son Alfred, and despite being half-vampire, he looked just like a normal human, reflecting on how he had started alone and was now surrounded by support. Haraku felt grateful for everyone who had joined him on this journey. Recalling the kindness shown through the gifts brought for Alfred, he wanted to find a meaningful way to thank them. Gathering all the leaders of the village, he revealed a reward medal he had created as a token of appreciation. Initially resembling money, Haraku explained his vision of eventually developing a currency for the village. Currently, all harvested food was distributed by him, 
but introducing currency would address biases towards certain goods by assigning them value. He began by offering these vouchers, exchangeable for anything, to each villager. Additionally, he granted Kiro and Zabutin's families 30 coins each. Reactions varied. The dwarves sought grape juice, while others desired furniture. Angels traded for Drime's weapons. As people began requesting furniture in exchange for currency, its value remained ambiguous. To engage children, they decided to rent out the mayor for a day instead. This marked the start of a new phase for the village. It was finally time for the big festival to celebrate his child's birth. All the girls were finally drinking juice for the first time in months. Donovan and the other dwarves brought a big barrel, claiming it was a special blend created by combining all of their white stuff from the salty biscuit games they played. Rue realized that this must be what the mallet was for, so with both of them holding it, they opened the barrel. Haraku never thought he'd be cracking a barrel open to celebrate something so fun, so he told everyone to drink up on the house that night. Grime was back at it again, but his count wanted to turn this into 50 shades of grey. All the girls enjoyed the juice, but Donovan asked him if he liked the new secret recipe. Blue informed him she couldn't drink anything since she now had mommy milkers, and Donovan thought his entire plan had been ruined. He had planned on stealing the mayor's wife, but he got an idea. He asked them to bottle it up so they could drink it soon. Haraku thought it would be great to bottle it up for 20 years so they could enjoy it when his child had matured, and Donovan's plan backfired. All this time, Haraku had caught on to the dwarf's plan. He knew Donovan's secret substance would impregnate anyone who drank it, but because he's such a beta, Haraku wanted to let him impregnate all the elves in the village with this drink so they would leave him alone. Donovan realized he was in trouble and ran to tell everyone to stop drinking. Haraku was glad that he was finally done with all this women. Both the demonic kingdom and the demonic kingdom had heard of Haraku's child being born and wished to congratulate them. Their village had grown much too strong, so they believed their only plan moving forward would be to marry Yuri off to one of the people living in the village. Michael received news of the birth and wished to send them the greatest gifts to continue having a long and beneficial relationship. Tia discovered that there were a lot of people still roaming the forest looking for a place to live, and Ryan's kingdom, along with the demonic kingdom, had recently had a lot of refugees needing to take shelter after the recent war. In total, it was over 100 people, and Haraku realized that their current village likely wouldn't have enough space for all of them. Ru suggests the perfect solution. They will create a second village for all of them. They all lived happily. That's it for this video. Watch the following video, and I will see in the next one.